Hey, Wade, how you doing, buddy? Oh, life is good, Rob. Uh, always a pleasure. I think we fixed our connection issues here, and uh, yeah, we need to go live time. from California. Yeah, so anyhow, well, let's get straight to it. Tonight, We Wade and I are honored to have one of the most influential people in the world when it comes to tarot. He is the author of dozens of books. He is the founder or one of the founders of the Tarosophy Tarot Association worldwide, which believes in the saying, restoring the spiritual dignity of the tarot. My gosh. Now, as a tarot reader of 26 years, um, I have had readings with a lot of people. I have experienced lessons, workshops, but I always find myself blown away by this guy. Um, he's recently come out with his deck, Tarot of the Everlasting Day. Um, he regularly gives new spreads, workshops, research on the practice of the tarot as a whole. And if you ask me, um, I hope in the next 20 years to do half of what he's done. It is my honor to welcome to Magic.TV, one of the men I respect, no, the man I respect the most in tarot in this world, the legendary Marcus Katz. Marcus, good evening. Hello, and thanks, Wade. Thanks, Rob, for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Welcome good morning, to the good show. afternoon, good evening, because I think we have one of each. The Philippines. So, Marcus, um, welcome to Magic.TV, Magic and Occultism Without Apologies. We would just like to ask you right now a bit of your history. When did it start? When did you start your search for the unknown, the esoteric? What was the what was first? Was it the magic? Was it the tarot? What? Please let us know because we want to know. Okay, thanks for asking. Um, <clears throat> well, I think I was always a bit of a weird child. Um, I guess my first memory of getting into magic was practicing astral travel. I was probably about between nine to ten. And um, I used to practice lying in bed one way and then <clears throat> imagining that I was turning over and looking the other way, but whilst physically lying in one place so I could get my astral body to turn um, within my own body and then project it outwards. Um, I started recording dreams very early on, so I then did a lot of dream work and um, <clears throat> There was a particular TV show that came on when I was a kid called The Tomorrow People, which was very much about a sort of set of young um, people who were each gifted with telekinesis, teleportation, uh, telepathy, and various other things. And I thought, ah, that's it. I'm definitely a tomorrow person. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, that led me to um, esotericism generally. Um, just looking at anything in the library that I could get my hands on, and that led me to witchcraft. I was then, um, I then located our occult shop in close to where I lived in a place called Derby, and I used to go to the occult shop even though I was probably um, too young to go there, um, and um, then I uh, bought. Uh, I think Dion Fortune and Alistair Crowley were my first purchases from, from the shop. Well, actually, a pentagram was the first purchase, but that got stolen out of the window um, in a robbery before I could actually um, purchase it. So um, I then ended up with a slightly different pen pentagram, which I still have to this day. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, the guy was interesting who ran the shop, proper... Um, old school 70s, 80s occult shop owner. And he said, well, before you read Crowley, before you read Dion Fortune, um, try this. And he gave me a book on yoga, sort of mental oh. yoga. So I first of all started to then, and I was about 14 at this time, and I still have my diaries from the time where I would assiduously write um, Dawn, um, um, various mudras, various um, mantras, and so on. Managed to practice for 10 minutes before my legs went to sleep. Yeah. Things like that. that happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, I can remember trying to invoke Merlin because he was like the only magician I knew as a kid. And so I wrote, um, you know, invoked Merlin this morning. I will see what happens at school today and so on. So 
Um, I did that until I was about 18, and as soon as I turned 18, I was initiated into the gardeneering tradition by a priest and high priestess um, who descended from Patricia Crowther, who obviously worked with Gerald Gardner. Um, <clears throat> and I then practiced a mixture of witchcraft and um, uh, Kabbalah. Um, I met another teacher around the same time. And so we practiced Golden Dawn ritual. We set up our own Golden Dawn temple. So I was about 19 to 21 at the time. And then I started traveling. I traveled for work quite a lot. And um, I set up a um, inner guide meditation workshop in Switzerland when I was about 20 and um, taught people there whilst practicing it myself every single day. And later on in this show i'm going to be teaching a lot about the inner guide meditation um both what's in the book and also some of the tricks that are sort of outside of it as well and then everything developed from there i um developed tarot um worked with tarot for quite a while um was asked to write a book on it when i was this was about 12 13 years ago now and um, so I wrote a book called Terosophy, which was a sort of brain dump of everything I'd studied up until that point yes. and on to down. Um, I thought, thought I, I took the approach with that book. If I get hit and killed in a road accident tomorrow, this is everything I've learned about the tarot so that people don't have to relearn it over the amount of time that I've learned it for, which was about 30 years by then. Um, and then it just took off from there. Um, uh, from that point on, um, my co-author and I, um, so Tolly Goodwin and I, we've written about 54 books. Wow. Um, and they're, they're quite big books, some of them. Um, the last book that um, Tolly, Charlotte Louise and I wrote together with our magical order um, came in at about 210,000 words. Wow. Um, and that's the Gregorian Angels book. And as with all of our stuff, it's practiced first. We never, ever write anything we've just made up. Um, we always practice it. We tweak it. Um, the Gregorian Angels uh, Magical Order worked on that for a year, every single day. Um, and then we actually went around it again for another year, working every single day on that particular practice to refine it. Then it took another year to actually write it and compile it together. So um, all of our stuff is is from from us. It's from our experience. None of it is just sat down. We need to write an Instagram post tonight. Let's just make something up. So um, it's it's from decades of experience. All right, I have a question. Um, as a member of Theosophy, one of the, the the vision of Theosophy has always been restoring the spiritual dignity of the tarot. And the minute I read that, I said, I'm in. Now, using the word restoring, it kind of meant that it means it was gone. Why was that the battle cry for terosophy? Please, I'd love to hear this from you. Um, shall we get into some of the hard-hitting bits now? <laughs> Are we oh, ready for that? It is your brainchild. Um, I'm supportive of it. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's some of the controversial bits. Um, one, one day I'm going to write, um, write the full story of um, my experience in the esotericism and esoteric groups because um, um, it does range from the very profound to the you cannot believe that this is really happening sort of thing. So, um, you yeah, know, very much from the sublime to the ridiculous. Perhaps that'd be a good title for the book, actually, from the sublime to the absolutely ridiculous. Um, so when I first started um, um, really reaching out with my tarot practice, I got involved in um, anyone and anything like um, pen pals and stuff like this. And this is almost just prior to the Internet or the Internet was just first starting. And um, I had a lot of really negative experiences with people who were practicing the tarot. Um, they certainly, certainly when I first started, I used to go to tarot readings at psychic fairs and ask them what they thought about the tarot. I, I'd sort of say, um, what does that symbol mean? And quite often I was just blown away by, they didn't seem to know. 
they didn't seem to even care what was on the cards. They were just reading them in whatever way. And I'd ask, I'd ask them, you know, how were you taught? Um, and they just refused to answer. Um, so I then joined a small UK-based amateur organization and um, very rapidly I became the chairman because um, that was very um, ad hoc. But as soon as I tried to bring in anything um, commercial or professional or um, uh, esoteric, um, it was just pulled to pieces by the membership. They, they just weren't interested in that. And I sort of got painted as a sort of corporate, evil, male, middle-aged genius trying to Dominion shut down. Room, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I just wanted a proper agenda at a meeting or something, or minutes or something like this, you know. Um, so I left that and then um, uh, Tolly Goodwin, who I was uh, working with at the time, she said, you know, you should set up your own organization. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, the, I haven't got time for anything like that. Um, and um, then I found um, I had 12 people write to me when I'd left this amateur organization, say, what are you setting up? We're in with it. And I was like, I'm not setting up anything. And then I thought, oh, I've got 12 people. That's a good number. <laughs> I have 12 followers. I can now part the Red Sea and do anything I want. Uh -huh. So um, I set up uh, with Tali Goodwin, whose idea it was originally, um, the Tarot Association. And um, the first thing we said is, what do we want to do? And around the same time, I'd just finished writing Tarosophy, and Naomi Zaniak, um, the author of the Aquarian Kabbalah book, um, she wrote a blurb for Tarosophy and said, Marcus Katz, Restoring the Spiritual Dignity of Tarot. And I thought, oh, I like that. Um, and also, that's not from me. It's from somebody else. Okay. So I asked her if we could use that tagline. She said, yeah, yeah, go for it. And it, it upset so many people. When we first put that on social media, Mm -hmm. So many people of our haters and detractors and all of the people who were on various forums at the time, I'm naming no names for the forums, but that forum no longer exists, um, were really like, how dare they say they're restoring the spiritual dignity um, of tarot? Um, you know, we never lost the spiritual dignity. Who are they to say they're restoring anything and so on? And the you more they... That I noticed. Sorry, something I noticed when I was um, I was working at uh, Ancient Ways in the Bay Area. Something I noticed back in the '90s, before forums and social media and all of that, was that periodically, and we had a shelf with just dozens and dozens of tarot decks. I noticed that there were a lot of them that people would produce, like an artist would produce his own tarot deck, just as a um, as a hustle or a goof or some way of having his ha having his art out there as a tarot without actually understanding what tarot is. And there was one, I can't think of the name of it, there was one that had been produced as a movie prop for a James Bond movie. Yeah, yeah, that was a produced it as an action, I remember that one. There were the witches. And people would come in and buy it. And it's just these primary colors just these cartoonish so how how often do you deal with people who want to argue the spiritual dignity of using movie props in their magic i mean is that something that people confront you about or when they they talk about well what do you think about the tarot of my neighbor's kitty cat or whatever it is that they've produced well, um, uh, my wife at the time used to produce the most intense, deep, psychologically profound readings using the gummy bear tarot. So um, I have no, um, and I've seen really crap readings done with the Thoth tarot. So mm -hmm. it, it's not down to the tarot. It's a bit like in Maverick Top Gun recently, where it's not the plane, it's the pilot. Same goes with the tarot. It's the reader, not the cards. And I think um, uh, 
Interestingly enough, the Tower of the Witches is one of the most hated tarot decks in surveys that we've done. And part of the reason is because Fergus Hall, the artist who designed that deck, it was originally meant to be used in the James Bond production. And um, um, they ended up using some Wade Smith cards and a couple of Fergus's cards. And as a result, um, Stuart Kaplan then decided to market it as Tarot of the Witches, even though it's got no witchcraft in it at all. Uh, Fergus Hall uh, did the Yes album covers. He was a surrealist artist. Um, and um, uh, as a result, people would go in, buy the Witches Tarot and go, what the hell is this? The instructions weren't clear, nothing to do with witches. Um, so they were always very disappointed. If you saw that deck as Fergus Hall's Yes album cover tarot deck, then maybe the audience would appreciate it a little bit more. Um, and interestingly enough, Fergus Hall actually ended up in a Buddhist retreat that is just up from where I live um, in the Lake District. Um, so his story is quite an interesting one in terms of the tarot. But um, I think I tend to argue like that. I just argue with the facts. Um, I do the research, I know the subject, and if I don't, I'm interested to find out from people uh, what it is that they think about it. Um, quite often when we're dealing with tarot skeptics, my advice, a bit like in martial arts, is always run away first. Always run away first. Um, and if you can't, then quite often I incorporate it. So if I have a tarot skeptic, I say, well, that's quite interesting because basically, as, as you all know, I mean, they're only pieces of cardboard, aren't they? There's nothing superstitious about them, if that's what they're telling me. So I repeat that back to them. And then I say, so out of all of these pictures, do you think that you could find a picture of someone who looks skeptical about the tarot? And then I let them find their own significator. Now I say, and now let's have a look at the two cards either side of that. If, for example, they were part of a comic book novel, because you told me you read comic um, graphic novels, what do you think would be going on in that? And then I just teach them how to do a reading. <laughs> so I, I, I never confront people. It's like the sort of, um, um, what's it called? The Aikido of tarot. What does say Aikido using their own momentum against them? And uh, with them. With them. <laughs> with them. No with them. In, Mysterium, just... in Mysterium, my students like to ask me, Sir Rob, what do I do if I have an, a person, I meet somebody, don't believe in the tarot, they don't believe in readings, and I just tell them, don't sell meat to a vegetarian. Simple as that. It's like, what's the point? Yeah. Why are you? Just, you, like you said, run away. And that's always been very helpful. Now, I have a very important question I wanted to ask you about your own personal practices in relation to the tarot. Um, I, we, all, we, all, we both happen to know you're a practicing magician of your own traditions. And I wanted to ask you, how has your experience with your holy guardian angel affected, augmented, or enhanced your practice of the tarot? Has it made it more mystical? Has it made it more accurate? Please share. We'd really like to know this. Well, well, it's a massive question. Um, I just recently republished a second edition of After the Angel, which is my diary of my experience of the Abraham Mellon ritual, which I did in uh, 2004. So that's um, quite a while ago now. Um, I, I had no intention of publishing my diary at the time. My only intent was to conduct the ritual itself. Um, and that was partly because I had been put in a situation where my entire career had led to a redundancy and I was given a stack of money six months without having to work and I thought I'm never going to get this opportunity again. So, um, but strangely enough, literally the day after I started the ritual, I ended up in another job for various reasons, which I account for in the book. And um, then I had to carry on the Abramelin because I'd started it and you do not stop if you start it. Um, um, during a very strange time and during that six months, I actually um, changed house, 
I changed job. I changed um, everything. Every, everything changed in the six months, even though I was prepared just to hunker down and just do a six month working. I thought at the end of it, everything all been changed and, and whatever. But it, why I called the book After the Angel, it was seven years later that I came to write the book because it was only seven years later I thought I can even begin to explain what that experience is in some way that it might be insightful to anyone else or useful to anyone else. Um, and to me, um, with the Abramelin, there's both the, the actual holy guardian angel itself, which um, we can define in lots of different ways. People sometimes confuse it with the higher self or the interior self or the Ogwadis or various other things. And I think um, to me, it's, it is a distinct personality, but it has no interest in what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the practice leads you to a, a very dangerous position of absolute indifference to your own projected self and to the events of everyday life. Mm -hmm. And to try and live like that is nigh on impossible. It is impossible to live like that because you have to decide to get up in the morning. You have to decide what you're going to do. You have to communicate with other people. And the angel has no interest in any of these things. The angel serves to remind the practitioner that the universe is not an interior or exterior event. Mm -hmm. I guess for most of us, to begin with, we tend to see the world as happening outside of us. There's like an outside world where things happen that we have no control over. And there's an interior world where we have our own dreams, our own thoughts. When the Abramelin angel comes along, one of the first things it does is it turns that inside out. And the best way I can describe it is if you imagine a balloon, okay? So if you imagine a balloon, a child's bread balloon, um, and if you imagine that our sense of awareness is the inside surface of the balloon, so when you think of yourself as um, Rob, as Wade, as whoever's watching this, as me, that is the inside of the balloon looking into the space that is bound by, by the inside of the balloon. So that's all of the air that's inside it. And you know that there's an outside. And the outside of the balloon is everything that's not on the inside of it. But you can't know everything that's out there. It's just limitless, um, void, void, formless, um, endless. It's an endless light that's on the outside of it. And you're on the inside of the skin of the blue. When you've conducted the Abramelin, the angel, um, I'm not quite sure of the right word to use, um, provokes, engineers, something along those lines, the sense of awareness suddenly then becomes the outside of the skin of the balloon. So now your awareness is completely beholden to everything. You know that there's an inside of the balloon because that used to be you. Mm -hmm. But you have no real connection with it other than being on the outside of it. So suddenly you're on the outside of yourself. Yourself is now a fiction and reality is now reality not some sort of internalized projection to it. Yeah. So all of and of course, nothing has changed. The balloon is still the balloon. Outside the balloon is the balloon. Inside the balloon is still the balloon. Nothing has changed other than your shift of awareness. Then you've got to work out how you can actually maintain the balloon whilst being refocused, reorientated to balancing the pressure between the outside of the balloon, the universe, truth, authenticity, reality, and your own internalized little balloon version of it. Mm -hmm. And that's what the angel is there to help with. 
not to actually tell you anything. It doesn't have any bloody good advice whatsoever because it doesn't understand the inside of the balloon. That's your problem. So the angel is there to keep the pressure there to remind you of um, the fact that you're supposed to be pointing outwards as opposed to inwards. And as a well, result... It's, it's who you are. Yeah. Is right? the, um, it's who you are. Yeah. The, your angel. It's, it's the, the you that you have to get to know again. Um, and I, I noticed that when you had, you had talked about what happened when you started, uh, Rob and I just had this conversation uh, at the before the beginning of the show that sometimes when you start an operation, you start getting the results while you're still in prep. And when you said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah well, you know, I started the operation, um, I changed jobs, I changed house. In the space of a week, when I started doing mine, and I had done it as per Labor Samek, um, I, okay. in the space of a week, I, I had left my job, uh, l wrecked my car, lost my wife and child. Uh, they were across the country. I was homeless. I, everything, I had let go of everything. And I was happier than I'd ever been in my entire life to be homeless. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I recount an experience about halfway through the Abra Mountain where <clears throat> I was in a car um, um, my uh, wife at the time and son were in a car in front of us. The removal van was in front of them. We were headed up the motorway. The phone rang in, in my car and I said, um, hello, I'm Marcus. Um, and the person said, oh, we'd like to give you the job in the Lake District that you applied for. And I said, oh, that's great. That's wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. And um, she said, um, what's that noise? And I said, oh, that's my cat. My cat is on the, on the passenger seat. We're driving up to the lakes. And she said, but how did you know you'd get the job? And I said, well, I, I, I didn't. And at that particular point, up until that moment, I was both locationless, jobless. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an entirely different experience, which is why... I, you know, advise people, and I've made this really clear in the second edition of the Abra Melon, that you should only start it if you are a prepared to lose everything, and b um, not engaged in anything else at the time. When I started yeah. it, I wasn't involved. I I had a six month space. I had um, I was as the Abra Melon says, I was my own master for that period of time, or so I thought. And that is the only reason I started it. Um, I would certainly not start it and expect to keep any semblance of actual normal life. Because that's not the point. It isn't just, um, as one of my teachers said, after a time, everything is just a different flavor of ice cream. Every experience is just, do you want this ice cream or this ice cream, ice cream with sprinkles on top? It's just all ice cream. And at some point, you have to decide you're sick of ice cream. No matter what the flavor, no matter how nice it tastes, no matter how surprising it is, no matter how much it's your own favorite or anything else, how novel it is, um, you just you want to transcend the ice cream. And that, I guess, comes back to where I see the tarot is as a language that still allows us to communicate the bare bones of the esoteric experience. And that's where I started with it, and that's um, where I'll certainly finish with it, um, is that tarot is, I, I decided first to teach tarot so that I could teach a language by which I could then explain the other stuff. So after a while of learning French, you might eventually want to go to France and realize why you've been learning French all of that time. Exactly. And the same with the tarot for me. You know, you are learning tarot, as far as I'm concerned, in order to comprehend, communicate, and explore um, an interface to Western esoteric mysticism, to the spirituality that's beyond it. And this is why it is restoring the spiritual dignity of tarot. It isn't restoring the spiritual dignity of people. It is restoring the 
location of an artifact in its proper context. That's and beautiful. it's the context that it's always been used in. Wait, um, Crowley, the Golden Dawn. It, it, it amused me. I was reading book T recently by the Golden Dawn, and probably written by Mathers hacking off, Mackenzie hacking off, Eliphas Levi. Nice. Um, I always joke that the only tradition in Western esotericism is making up a tradition. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, all of them, um, when we look at book T and look at the keywords and them saying, well, Kabbalistically, then Hokma is like this, Bina is like this, um, um, Hesed, Gibor, Tifreth, Esau, Malka, they're all these, um, when it applies to the minors of the Arcana, Everyone who writes a tarot book now starts it off with, first of all, you have to learn the numbers. And the numbers for uh, the keywords for ones or twos and threes are like this. And they are all beholden to the golden door. Mm -hmm. Whether they like it or not, whether they still use the same sort of keywords, but most of them do. Some of them say, well, it's Neoplatonic or um, it's on, on numerology, but they just read it online somewhere. Um, it all goes back to book T, and that goes back to the Kabbalah, goes back to its teaching as an English tree map, and it's still there in the tarot, no, no matter what people do with it. Now, speaking of decks, I wanted to ask you, you recently released the Tarot of the Everlasting Day, am I correct? And correct. I remember, I think in 2017, you kind of put a, a teaser of it, and it said, this is coming from the Tarot of Seven, uh, Everlasting Day to be released in 2021. So I was like, oh, good grief. <laughs> it's like, that's going to take forever. But now it's finally come out. I'd like to ask you, what were some of your motivations in creating this deck? And um, did you want to follow a structure of like the Rider White Smith approach? Or were you trying to make your own um, interpretation that would be outside the beholdenness of the Golden Dawn? Yeah, I guess the answer is none of the above. Um, um, one, one thing with... The, after the angel with after the abramelin is um, when we consider occult concepts like the secret chiefs, people talk about the, the hidden masters or the secret chiefs, um, much like the um, abramelin and the holy god in angel, it's a very, very different um, reality. The secret chiefs, if you like, are a sort of global version, a universal version of the angel. And as a result, they guide you and to some extent guard you uh, for what that's worth um, in what you're doing. And the, the trick is to follow, is to surrender and follow to whatever the universe is telling you to do next. You have no will in this at all. Um, will is one of the first things. Ironically, it's a thelemite that you surrender. But I think Crowley, in his more profound writings, would agree with this, that discipline and duty to thelema, to your own true will, are equivalent to the universe's will. And to understand the difference between that without getting ego aggrandizement and things like that, is is tricky if not impossible i think but as a result you sort of follow the cues and with the tarot deck um, um it was janine Hord, a canadian artist and a student on our academia tarot course who uh, wrote to tali and i and said i see that you've rediscovered the trinic deck which was white second deck that was held in secret for a century um, until Tali discovered it in the British Museum or rediscovered it. It had been there and had been mentioned before, but no one really thought to go and have a look at it. And um, so we had uh, written a book about that, um, Abiding in the Century, and uh, showcased these images and some that aren't in the British Museum that uh, came to me by, by another way. And Janine... We, we didn't want to produce a tarot deck of them because they are not designed for tarot cards. They were designed for temple um, teaching um, mm. to be used in a bit like the tracing boards of free, free Masonic teaching. 
And so the tarot cards, we didn't want to produce a deck, but Janine wrote to us and said, would you like me to reproduce them? And we said, wow, that'd be a great idea. Um, it doesn't break any copyright and we can use all of the unpublished work of weight that we had access to but couldn't publish. And we could use that and we could showcase that in a deck. But the moment we started it, we thought, we, we don't want to just copy weight and Trinic's work. Let's use this opportunity to use the Trinic inspiration and weights more profound mysticism in our own deck and to teach our own teachings. So that's really where that came from. Amazing. And we, so it's, hmm? what? What? Um, yeah, we knew it was going to take um, at least 12 years, which I think it did in the end, but we thought we were going to have a whole deck by that time. But because Janine did them in large oil paintings, that is not just a digital deck. It's not just, using um, um, you know, paint shop and Photoshop are all very good, but um, Janine was working in real oils on large canvases, um, so it took a long time. And our original idea was to do three decks, each of which would be one step above the other. So we are still looking for an artist for the beginner's deck, but that will have clues in it, keys in it, for the inner, uh, for the union deck, for, for the deck we have out now. And we have an artist already for the inner deck and we're going to start off and I'll reveal this for an exclusive here on the show. Um, we are going to actually have a deck, hopefully with not just the 22 major arcana, but the 10 Sephiroth in them wow. as well. Um, because weight actually does mention somewhere, it's a little known quote, but it is there, that technically there should be 32 major arcana. And when he did his work with Trinic, there is one of those images which re represents Darth on the Tree of Life. Mm -hmm. It is designed exactly like the other cards or the other images for the major arcana. But to weight, each of these was an image um, of the paths and the Sephiroth are paths as well. So our inner deck is going to have, hopefully have all 32 of the paths. And our outer deck, which will be for beginners, we are hoping if we can get an artist to do it with us, uh, which is, it's been more troublesome than I would have thought, but you know, we will take our time to find one. Um, um, that will be unique in the sense that it will have an interchangeable pit card like the Marseille deck and scenic cards like the Wade Smith deck. So the majors will stay the same, but you can swap out uh, the minor arcana for pit cards or for a uh, for scenic cards, a bit like the Wade Smith. And each of them, all three decks, will mirror each other. So anything you learn in the bottom deck, the beginner's deck, you won't have to relearn something else when you get onto the esoteric deck or the mystical deck that's, that's above it. So it's kind of like a three-level kind of experience, taking you just from the divinatory to the spiritual to the mystical using the deck, am I correct? The three decks, am Exactly. I it, it's sort of practical, um, magical, and then mystical or spiritual. Wow. And we're using wow. the tree of life in three different sets of correspondences for that. So the outer deck is built around the more commonly known Golden Dawn um, mm -hmm. system of attributions. The middle deck is the way Trinic system of attributions and the inner deck is my own um, system of correspondences, which is very similar to the Trinic bar one or two very I can say minor changes. They're quite big changes, but there's only one or two of them. So will the second and third deck come with their own ritual book or magical uh, like handbook for personalized experiencing of, of the magic? Yeah, and the outer deck will have a course and a beginner's uh, mm -hmm. manual with it and everything else. The union deck has our own um, um, keys to the... Um, Everlasting Day book that we've already written for it. Um, unfortunately, that's sold out that date now um, with the Kickstarter. 
So we might not be producing the union deck for a little while. And the inner deck will only be available to members of our order. So, oh, so it's want, it's, that's going to be initiatory, in other words. Absolutely. And we want to re-establish re the sense of secret images that are only known to members of an occult order. Well, count me in. I'm looking forward to that one. So let's give you a round of applause for that upcoming deck. Wow, I mean, I'm already excited to hear this one. All right, so that's a lot about Marcus's personal history, and I'm sure we could write novels about that. The next segment of the show is, of course, the advocacy aspect. This is where I pick Marcus's brain about what he thinks about the present stance of not just ma magic, occultism, but even tarot locally, worldwide. What do you think is going on? What are your own two cents? What are your hopes? What would you like to see improved? Um, at the end of the day, um, we want to see things move forward. And as, an, as one of the contributors to the growth of education in tarot and in magic, um, I'd love to hear your two cents. So what, what's your take on things right now? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Please fill it for us. Okay, so um, I tend to keep in my own track as far as um, the world of tarot goes. Um, I hate the idea of referring to a tarot tribe because... Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the word tribe um, usually commentates a rigid set of instructions, one chief, and you get kicked out of the tribe if you don't follow the rules. Um, I, th I think it's just a shame that tarot and tribe are alliterative. So a lot of people talk about the tarot tribe because it sounds good, but tribe is not the right word for, um, for certainly what I see in, in tarot, that's for sure. So um, having said that, I have an interest in things that um, seem to be progressive. And um, by progressive, I mean the things I listed in Terosophy. Towards the end of Terosophy, which I think is about 15 years ago now, um, I made some predictions based on the cards themselves from what the future of Tarot would bring. Mm -hmm. And... Um, um, so when I see those happening, I, I like to get involved in them. And one good example is the Alleyman's Tarot. Yeah, now, great deck. For, now, for those that don't know it, it's a magpie deck. That's the phrase that's, that it's been called. Built, and it's, a, it's not really a tarot deck. It's a collection of about 200 cards from different people's decks shoved together with an overarching narrative that you go down an alley the alley man has this cobbled together tarot that is unique and it can give you all sorts of readings. And it was the first Kickstarter for tarot that broke a million dollars. Wow. So it went through a million dollars of funding. And um, as a result, it's become quite popular. Um, and that was something I sort of predicted in Terosophy was that in the future, as the means of producing images becomes more available to people. It's a bit like the means of producing magazines has become available to anyone with, you know, a printer. Um, then tarot decks will become more unique. They'll become more like the tarot deck I have will not be like the tarot deck anyone else has. And I, I did think when we were developing the... Um, deck for our cart here, one of our tarot projects, that has a deck that was designed for us, an oracle deck called the Truth Teller's deck. And the thing with the Truth Teller's deck is the rule is, is that you can design your own and should design your own deck, but you have to exchange it with somebody as soon as you can. You can only use somebody else's deck. You must never use your own deck. So as a result, that deck gets change from hand to hand over time and it's always unique because one person has sat down and designed the deck because it's simple images like a dog and a well and a crown and various other images so anyone can produce that deck um even me with my limited art skills um you, you know i can draw a stick figure of a horse and things like that and then that becomes a deck so i think that we're going to see a lot more of that that decks will become less beholden to structure and will start to dissipate more towards the, um, it's like moving from the Aeon of Osiris to Horus. Um, they'll become more individualized, more specific. Um, 
and less beholden to old structures. You know, the tarot decks of the old time are black. And to paraphrase Crowley in the Book of the Law, he said the rituals of the old time are black because he had it in for the Golden Dawn. But um, I think tarot will will loosen up. Um, I think as well when we again when we first were thinking about our cards here, we made the Truth Tellers deck the world's first augmented reality deck, and um, unfortunately the program we used for it has since been discontinued by Hewlett Packard um, because we were working with brand new apps and systems that were quite experimental. So I'm currently looking to make that available again in Spark AR, which is a meta Facebook um, product. Um, and that allows you to hold your phone over the cards and a flying scroll will come out of the card and tell you the meaning of the card and things like that. Um, I am exploring a lot of augmented reality stuff at, at the moment, but also I think the future of tarot will be in the metaverse as well. So I recently invested in a sort of Quest headset and um, I've been making my own tentative dizzying steps into the metaverse um, and trying to build little Golden Dawn temples inside the metaverse um, for people to um, join rituals in. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, th I think the future will be very digital and, yeah. and very individual. You know, Have you seen, Marcus, these... Um... Uh, uh, how do I say AI imageries that you put in a oh, word yeah. and yeah, it yeah. like comes out its own AI interpretation of, of, an, of an image based on the word. Do you think that that's going to affect tarot as a deck creation in the future? Is that going to have some sort of play in the future? Not particularly. I, I've seen illustrations already used in um, uh, rule books for games um, and role playing games where someone um, wants starships on a on a star starship background and things um magicians casting spells this sort of thing and the results aren't they're, 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 they're still quite abstract and again i think no matter what the tools that are available to us i think the um um it's still down to the design to the concept behind them um one of the things that got me back into tarot after a long period, um, a, a couple of years of being out of tarot, I was using I Ching and, and rings and things. I saw a deck that had, um, it was a Polish deck, and the page of wands was a page holding the knight's horse. So you could see the horse in the background. You could, And I suddenly thought, oh, my God, of course, the page is the page of the knight. Mm -hmm. Why have I never seen that in a deck? And I thought, oh my God, there's a new idea in tarot. That means that there are more. And that opened tarot back up for me. So I always think it's down to the new ideas that will um, be the game changers, not the technology. I think the technology will change things, but I don't think it will be more ice cream. It'll just be digital ice cream as opposed to other ice cream. It'll be a while before someone comes along with it totally new idea for it that's brilliant so once again thank you very much marcos for this ever so epic sharing let's give him a round of applause thank you because now we're going to be going into our ever so weighted occult x segment with marcus katz marcus has prepared something for us today something special straight from the wizard's mouth he will be teaching us a personalized technique of his so boys and girls now's the time to tune in and record because this is going to change the game for everyone let's give him a cheer first we're very happy to have him <laughs> all right marcus the floor is yours okay um okay folks um this is the inner guide meditation technique uh it was Popularized, it was developed, designed by uh, somebody called Edwin Steinbrecher. And I came across it um, from the occult shop, the Ace of Wands, when I was um, um, barely in my teens. And I started to use it, and um, a friend and I started to use it all the time. We were doing inner guide meditations for an hour a day, every day for years. And then I started to teach it to groups. As I mentioned earlier, when I first went to Switzerland, um, I taught it 
to the uh, New Age Discussion Group in Geneva for a while. And since then, I must have taught it to hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people. Now, um, there are, it's, right. So what it is, it's um, a closed eye technique, as we would say nowadays, as opposed to scaring people with meditation or contemplation. Nowadays, we say this is a closed eye technique, as opposed to saying we want you to contemplate or meditate for a while. Um, it's amazing how many people you can get to do meditation if you tell them it's a closed eye technique. Um, so Edwin Steinbrecher built this particular way of doing it in order to reach your inner guide, a guide within who represents your uh, central guiding collective. So it can be used as an image or a means of communication to all of your senses. So your intuition, your intellect, your experience, your wisdom, all of the things that you don't think you know, but somehow have collected inside your own head. So it's very useful. And often the guide will give you advice um, that seems completely bonkers, completely nonsensical, but will have magical effect in the universe because it is another way of seeing this balloon with the inside and the outside. If you push on one part of the balloon, the rest of the balloon changes. So if the inner guide tells you to wear red shoes for a week and the dispute with your neighbor will be over, you wear red shoes for a week and lo and behold, you see a for sale sign next door and your neighbor's moving. And it's like, what is the connection between that? Well, the connection, my friends, is correspondence. Correspondence is the, and shh, don't tell anyone, this is the biggest secret that I've learned in my years of occultism, probably won't learn another one, is correspondence is the secret. Western esotericism is built on correspondence. Correspondence is far more important than I ever realized and probably still haven't yet, but it's something that I think is critical to why bother learning that Mars corresponds with red, corresponds with the number five, corresponds with the pentagram, corresponds with iron, corresponds with tobacco, and so on. Why bother learning any of that? Well, the answer, my friends, is correspondence. Um, and it's because that allows you to move the balloon in certain ways. And so the inner guide meditation, you close your eyes and Edwin Steinbrecher sort of boiled down a load of different things, Jungian therapy, symbolism, dream symbolism, and shamanism, and astrology, most importantly, to this simple method. You close your eyes, you imagine that you're on a shore, a shoreline, a beach. The sea is always behind you, so you have to visualize that the sea is behind you. And in front of you, you can see a cliff, and you can see a cave entrance. And the cave entrance can take on whatever form you see it as. If it seems to change, then go and touch it. Actually look down at your own feet, see what your feet are wearing. That helps you embody it. You must be looking out from your own eyes, seeing what you would see, hearing what you would hear, feeling what you would feel as you approach that cave entrance. You can touch it to see if it's warm or cold, moist or dry, rough or smooth. And then allow yourself to enter into the cave and you always take the exit that is to the left at the back of the cave. Whenever I've tested that with people and not told them, 99% of the time it is always to the left at the back of the cave as Steinbrecher said it would be. You are then going to exit and we're going to do this quite rapidly. So imagine that you're on a sort of conveyor belt through this guided meditation you leave the cave out the back of the cave through the left hand exit and then you come out into a landscape that is unique to this experience, unique to you, unique to the inner guide meditation. Maybe one that you recognize or half recognize. It's usually outdoors. And I would like for you to call to yourself now in a mental call out into this landscape to call for your animal guide to come to you. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the animal guide will, could, could be a bird, 
could be any sort of animal or reptile. It's usually a real one known to us on Earth as we live nowadays. It's not usually anything different. And when you have your animal guide, and for the sake of the presentation, uh, we're just going to move this forward at a reasonably rapid rate. I would like you to touch your hand to the animal so that you can get a sense of what it feels like, what its attitude is to the world. And you can also ask it its name, which is a real cool thing in the inner guide meditation that you can actually find the name of things, the secret name of all things. Um, in the same way that we once did a long time ago in a garden, we gave everything its name. And now it's time for that to give you its name back so you can hear the secret of the mystery of the name of the animal in this case. And then when you have the name of the animal, I would like you to ask the animal if it can take you to your inner guide. And at this point, you can then move forward and you can follow the animal to your inner guide. And for, again, for the sake of this rapid run through of the experience, this speed run of it, what you can do is when the animal takes you to a figure, you can test the figure to see if it is your inner guide by placing your palms, palm up in front of you, asking the inner guide to place their palms upon yours and asking for the feeling that the inner guide has for you. And that should be an overwhelming feeling. I won't give spoilers as to what the feeling should be, but it should be fairly incontestable that this figure has a position in your inner world that is unique to being a guide for you. And it will give that feeling directly to you. And sometimes that can be a little bit overwhelming. Sometimes it can be um, a shade of the real feeling um, tuned down for you. Um, but nonetheless, it's a unique feeling that you will have in that experience. And then from there, I would like you to thank your inner guide for making itself known even in the speed run of this experience that you will come and visit again, having now opened up the opportunity to visit such a place within, such a time within, such a being within and then you can retrace your steps unless the inner guide has anything for you to do before you retrace your steps um, and call the animal back if the animal is not still with you follow the animal back to the outside of the cave and then literally come through the cave notice in particular if anything in the cave has changed since you came in that will sometimes be quite indicative of something then you can gradually leave, see the ocean in front of you, and then gradually let the whole experience fade into your background so that you can reorientate yourself to the room and allow yourself to be here now and present fully in this moment. And in your body, just give yourself a shake if you actually did that for real. I wasn't expecting that, but nonetheless, we went with it. Um, so, um, and that is basically a speed run of the inner guide meditation i had a, a base it was as soon as i started i realized that this is something that i'm really going to have to get into when i'm not on the show for sure but <laughs> the thing is there's actually a cave near here in a cliff next to the ocean and i know this cave and i went through and I'm, I'm kind of like following as you're narrating and I go through and there's naturally an opening to the left. And when I got there, there was a deer, like a young buck. Excellent. And before you had even said to hold my hands, I held my hand out and he licked my palm and left a sigil behind. Wow. So yeah. there is, well, and basically he went to his nest and he's like, no, you're going to have to come back. This is going to be a thing. Next. So I've, I've got a new I've got a new toy to play with, a new bone to chew on, which I always love. Well, I I made this my technique for three or four years. I've done it thousands of times. I always get something out of it. Um, 
Um, we have a Facebook group for the Inner Guide Meditation, which has been very quiet because I've not really come back to the technique for quite a while, but, um, but there is one there. The book is very good. Um, not everything in the book I still hold with. There are certain things that I disagree with and um, just from experience over the years. Um, now, one really, I'd, I'd like you to leave this section at least with this one important thing. Steinbrecher really based it on astrology. He was an astrologer by trade. And one of the incredible things you can do with this is translate your natal chart, your birth chart, into tarot cards, and then use the inner guide meditation to orientate yourself and interact with those tarot cards with the inner guide. So you can ask the inner guide to take you to your blasted tower or to your moon and high priestess and that will directly work and interface with your own birth chart so it makes it a completely unique individualized workbook for your whole interior life based on astrology it's the most dramatic powerful means i know of to actually activate your chart to really live through your chart, work with your chart, work with your shadow, uh, work with your rising sign and, and everything else. I love the technique because it is so adaptable to anything. Um, and um, we, we have a workbook, just to plug my friend um, Lynn Birkbeck. Um, he worked with me to design a workbook that churns out your chart, churns out text for you and then produces a little map of tarot card correspondences so you can dive straight into the technique and work directly with your own being um, through it. And again, I love it because it's safe, it's good for beginners, and also we don't then have to unteach people anything later on because they're already learning the correspondences that we end up um, teaching in the Western Esoteric Industry System that I teach. Wonderful. You know, Marcus, that that experience itself just shows how much undiscovered territory there is when it comes to the tarot and when it comes to meditation. And I'm blown away. I'm really, really blown away. And with that, I just wanted to thank Marcus once again for being our guest of honor tonight. Um, it has been such an amazing time. Now, before we say thank our you. goodbyes, thank of you. course, we always ask our guests to say something special at the end of the show. Marcus, you want to say something nice for all of us? Okay, so I'm Marcus Katz. I am on Magic TV with Wade and Rob, and we have been discussing how to bring about the spiritual dignity of not just tarot, but the whole of Western magic. How about Amen. that? Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, Wade, anything you want to say to Marcus before we let him go? <clears throat> Thank you for uh, being on the show, for giving us all uh, new toys to play with. And um, I look forward to uh, continuing with this. I want to see where it goes. Yeah, and, you know, maybe in the future, if he's not too busy, we can have him on again. I'm, there's like an entire mountain worth of knowledge that Marcus can share with us. I know he's a very busy man, but we really appreciate the time and the support he has given to this show. Marcus, from the bottom of my heart, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is a dream come true. So, everyone, thank you very much. We will not have an episode of Magic.TV next week because we'll be preparing for our next special guest two weeks from now stay tuned because we will announce via video who our guest is going to be so marcus once again thank you for this time thank you for your support and remember if you want to get marcus's amazing deck tarot of the everlasting day get it because it's a game changer and his books i don't know which ones to recommend but because there's so many but if you ask me tarosophy is the game changer that's where it started, and that's where I'd recommend everybody begins. But the rest of his books are equally as amazing. So once again, thank you very much. I'm Rob Rubin. This is Magic.TV. See you all in two weeks.